The Sahara, the most unforgiving desert on Earth, stretches like a dry, rolling sea across 10 countries. Once, though, there were no borders. North Africa was all one place, known by one name, Libya. When the armies of ancient Rome entered its desert heartland, they found a place of mystery and terror, a land as unknown to them as contemporary Libya is to us. And that's why I'm here, to try and discover something of modern day Libya, on a journey to the ends of the ancient Roman world, as I follow in the tracks of the chariots. Libya is in North Africa. It's 90% desert, but it's also got the longest Mediterranean coastline of any country. And as I arrive in this little known country by sea, just as the Romans did more than 2,000 years ago, I realize that this is to be a journey of contrasts and surprises. My name is David Adams, and as a photojournalist, I travel to some of the most isolated places on the planet. This journey takes me far from the Mediterranean and Libya's capital, Tripoli, into the heart of the Sahara and on to the Akakis Mountains on the Algerian border. Ali, Jamal and Mohammed are Berbers, one of North Africa's original tribes. But their lifestyle is pure Mediterranean. Well, well. Okay. Okay. They learned to catch octopus even before they started school, like their father before them and his father. <laughs> <laughs> this is a particularly persistent octopus. The interesting thing about catching octopus here is it's the same way they've been doing it for thousands of years. So the Carthaginians and the Greeks and the Romans, everybody up to present day Berbers like these guys, have been doing it the same way because it's the best way to catch an octopus. When the first Europeans arrived on these shores, they found a place of plenty. The seas rich with fish, the land fertile and warm. The perfect place to establish a foothold from which to explore the rest of Africa. The Greeks got here first but it was the Romans who left the most indelible mark on the country. On the shores of the Mediterranean, they built a city to rival anything in Europe, Leptis Magna. It still stands today, the best preserved Roman city in the world. There's some absolutely remarkable pieces right through Leptis Magna, but not all of them have laid around for 1,500 or more years unused. These three were destined for the palaces of Europe, actually for Versailles.
Leptis remains undisturbed to this day. Wandering alone in these ruins, it's easy to imagine what life would have been like here in its heyday. Located at the end of the North African Trans-Saharan trade routes, it quickly became rich trading in slaves, ivory, gold and wild animals. And like all of the Roman Empire's cities, it had its Circus Maximus, its gladiator's arena. Indeed, this was the most famous amphitheatre in the whole empire outside of Rome's own Colosseum. Even 2,000 years after the slaughter and the hysteria, this is still a powerful place. Walking out here still evokes an unsettling feeling. Put a few stone blocks back in place and Ridley Scott's Oscar-winning gladiator could easily have been filmed here. But even more popular than the hand-to-hand -hand fights of the gladiators were the chariot races. Well, this is the chariot arena of Laptus. Now, if you remember the movie Ben-Hur, with 15 or 20 chariots hurtling around an arena, well, this was the African version. I mean, can you imagine what it would have been like? There would have been thousands of people up along these bleachers, and then down here, the chariots would have roared around this circular path. The chariot provided more than just entertainment. It was a war machine. The vehicle in which the Romans headed south to conquer Africa. Next stop is Tripoli, where I'm to meet my Arabic translator. And another surprise, Libyans love horse racing. Horse racing is a time-honoured tradition in Libya. For all I know, these horses may be able to trace their bloodlines back to those that pulled the chariots. Libyans may love the races, but they never lose their shirt. In Libya, there's no betting. These guys are Islamic, and Quranic law forbids gambling. They come here purely for the sport. Today, this is about as close as you'll get to a chariot race. After a short stop at the track, I make it into the heart of the city. I'm not really sure what I expected to find in Tripoli, but it wasn't this, a vibrant, modern city. Libya is regarded by many as a rogue nation. It's up there with Afghanistan and Iraq, a haven for terrorists and Islamic extremists. Surely the architect of the Libyan revolution, Muammar Gaddafi, rules over a backward and medieval world. Well, another surprise, it isn't. Not so surprising, though, are these. Gaddafi is everywhere. Indeed, there's a whole industry exclusively devoted to churning out all these Gaddafis. They may be everywhere, but it's hard even for posters to obscure the charms of ancient Tripoli. Just a few short steps from the modern city lies the old town. The street plan unchanged since the days of the charioteers. It's here that I meet my translator, Najat, and even she is not at all what I expected. Najat is the female face of modern Muslim Libya. She's educated, wears no veil, and is free to meet me alone. Hello. 
She can even meet me in one of Tripoli's defiantly traditional coffee houses. Like the rest of the Arab world, the coffee house is the preserve of men. Najat may be the very model of a modern Libyan woman, but Libya is still a very conservative place, especially outside Tripoli. So have you ever been in the desert? In the desert? Yeah. No. No? No. Because no. I think we're going to do some camping. Yeah? Yeah? Yeah. OK. <laughs> While women can enter Tripoli's coffee houses these days, they still almost okay. never travel to the desert. Najat has lived here all her life, and yet she's never been. How is it exactly? Well, it's, I mean, it's, it's a lot of fun because you sleep under the stars. And so every, every, you wake up in the middle of the night and all yeah. you see is the, is the sky. I mean, yes. it's beautiful. I can imagine this. If she's to come, she needs permission from her parents and family. With this in mind, and Colonel Gaddafi watching over us, we make yeah, plans to head south. So about how many days that we have to... About two weeks. Two weeks, no south. problem. I can take three weeks if you want. Yeah? Yeah. That'd be a, uh, great. Yeah. Okay. From Tripoli, the tracks of the chariots lead to a place that struck terror into the hearts of Roman soldiers. They gouged out their eyes just to return home. And it's my next stop. Today, the road out of Tripoli is a good one. A hundred miles out of most other African capitals, and you'd be driving on dirt tracks. Any charioteers heading for the Sahara 2,000 years ago wouldn't have had it quite so easy. The next leg of my journey takes me from Libya's fertile Mediterranean coast to the town of Gadames, on the edge of the Sahara. This is a very funny little car. <laughs> yes. I don't know if it'll make it all the way across the desert. <laughs> a couple of hours into our journey, it struck me that my translator, Najat, had managed to leave Tripoli rather easily. I wondered if she was here to keep an eye on me, officially. You're not, you're not like the spy, like the, um, you know, Mata Hari? Yeah. Like Mata Hari? Yes. Yes? Yeah. <laughs> it's good, I've always wanted to travel with a, with a famous spy. <laughs> I'm still not sure if Najat's here to keep an eye on things, but this guy definitely is. He's the reason Najat could leave town so easily. His name's Naji, and he's Najat's brother. Hello, how are you? Good. And he's to be her chaperone for the rest of our journey. Her family gave her permission to accompany me, only on the understanding that he would come too. We're heading for the ancient town of Gadames, but before we get there, Najat asks me to pull over to show me the abandoned Berber village of Kabia. It's like a catacomb. You know catacombs? That's impressive, isn't it? The Berbers are the great traders of the North African coast. It was in warehouses like these that their ancestors stored perishable produce, like olives, oil, cheese, salted meat, and other foodstuffs, which they traded with the trans-Saharan caravans for slaves and ivory. In this underground maze, conditions remain a constant, comfortable 18 degrees centigrade, 64 degrees Fahrenheit. You could see all the, um, with the vases that kept the oil. Outside, though, things are different. During the day, the temperature can build to over 50 degrees centigrade, about 120 degrees Fahrenheit, while at night, it plunges to below freezing. It seems like it's made for people this big. Yes, yeah? yes. <laughs> it was this unique and hostile environment 
that caught the imagination of the first Europeans to hear about it. Writing 200 years before the Romans arrived, the Greek historian Herodotus gives us the first recorded glimpse of this ancient land. From Thebes to the Pillars of Hercules lies a waterless desert. Here live the Garamantes. They hunt in chariots, they eat snakes and lizards, and speak a language like no other, and squeak like bats. Herodotus's Africa was a land of legend, of mysterious people lost to history, a place of warriors and charioteers. It's a very nice view. It is this world that we're now entering, for this is the point where one Libya ends and another begins. The fertile north is behind us, and before us, the vast, barren interior. This is Gadames, and it doesn't take me long to realize that it's a far more conventional Islamic town than Tripoli. The reason I wanted to come here is because Gadames was the most southerly outpost of the Roman Empire. 2,000 years ago, this was the ends of the earth. Can you imagine what it would have been like to have been stationed here? For a Roman soldier, this was hell on earth, literally the edge of empire. Now the only way to get out of here, the minimum requirement, was to lose an eye. And that's exactly what they did. They dug their own eyes out so they could get out of here. When I first planned on coming to Libya, this was to be my ultimate destination. It was to be a journey to the ends of the Roman Empire. Now I'm here, though, I'm told Rome's influence extended well beyond this town to the place Herodotus refers to, the land of the Garamantians. A few hundred miles further south, there's a city buried in the sand, a desert Atlantis that proves that the chariot went further than history records. But to get there, I need a desert guide. Naji knows of one, so he sets off to try and track him down, leaving Najat and I to explore the old city. Like Carbeo, Gadamas was built to cope with the environment. Every wall, alcove and opening carefully designed for climate control. When temperatures outside swelter, it's cool down here. Though few live here anymore. They've moved to the neighbouring new city with its modern amenities and the lure of satellite TV. Most, though, keep their old homes as retreats from the heat in the summer. Fantastic room. Yeah. For this place, it's a living room. Yeah. You know? And this is, it's a bedroom. Bedrooms off the side? Yeah. This tiny alcove is also for sleeping, but only the Actually, owner's wife was ever allowed to use it. Uh -huh. The woman, when she got married, this is the first time, yeah. and the second time, when she, her husband dies. Yeah, she's sitting here, and she received her relative. You oh, know, really? Yeah. So only twice, only twice in the whole life yeah. they use this room? Yeah. It's a wow. very special room. I'm going to have a look upstairs. The roof is also a no-go zone for men. This was where the women of Gadames spent much of their time. No, could you stop here? Because here it's only for women. Really? Yeah. The men, they cannot come here. It's where they raised their yeah. children and did their daily chores. 
safely hidden from the prying eyes of men. This place, usually, the women, they are meet each other here, spending nice time here, in the afternoon, sitting, stalking, laughing. So they could travel from each roof to... Yes, without they are meet each down. other here. Wow. Yeah. A whole different world. <laughs> yeah. From up here, they look down on a world dominated by men. And this is something they would have seen many times. It's an event peculiar to Gadames. An ancient order of monks is gathering, as they've done every Islamic holiday for centuries, to celebrate the life of the Prophet. They're Sufi mystics. By chanting phrases from the Quran over and over, they hope to communicate directly with the Prophet and bring good fortune to the community. The square in which they gathered was once a slave market. Many of the slaves that made Leptis Magna and Rome's other African cities rich came from Gadames. Most sold right here in this square. And these guys are the descendants of the people who brought them to be sold here, the Tuareg. These nomads controlled the North African slave trade right up until the end of the 19th century. And if their music sounds familiar, there's a reason. The blues weren't born in Mississippi, they were born in Africa and taken to America by slaves the Tuareg sold. The Tuareg may no longer deal in slaves, but they're as fiercely independent as ever. Now, as in Roman times, anyone who travels further south than Gadames has to enter their territory on their terms. The next leg of our journey across the uncharted wasteland the Tuareg call home starts tomorrow. But not before we witness a meeting of these fearsome warrior clans. Following in the 2,000-year-old chariot tracks of the Roman army across the Sahara is not something to be taken lightly, even on Libya's good sealed roads. The next leg of our journey takes us from Gadames in northwestern Libya to the oasis of Gabron on our way to the Akakas Mountains. This is the land of Africa's last nomadic warriors the Tuareg, and we're on the way to a wedding. I've read that, um, that women in, in Libya get married quite late, so in their 30s and sometimes in their 40s. Why is that? Yeah, you know, the problem here, because the wedding, it's, it costs too much money, you know? Really? Yes. So what about you? Do you have a boyfriend? I had an engagement before, uh -huh. but now we're finished. But sometimes you feel that you cannot live with someone like this. Yeah. 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 Oh, well, that happens. That happens it's in happened, the West, too. Yeah. 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 I'm still unmarried, you know? And, really? Yeah, so... <laughs> I, too. I travel too much. But um, it's the same. You've got to find the right person. Yes. You're right. Yeah. Tuareg territories cover a vast area of the central Sahara and spread across the borders of Libya, Mauritania, Niger, Algeria and Mali. And because of strategic alliances between the great clans, they can cover great distances to attend intertribal events. On the outskirts of Gadames, we've been invited to attend one such meeting of the clans at a wedding. At the start, the men and the women are separated. 
the men waiting for the women to prepare the nuptial tent. Dressed in indigo robes, the groom patiently waits, portraying no wedding day butterflies or doubts. Do you know which one is the bride? I think the, the white one. In the white? Yeah. Kind of the purpley, purpley yeah. white. Okay. It's very hard to tell. Yeah. As the tent is built, we watch from a respectful distance. It's both unusual and a great honour to be allowed to witness such a ceremony. The groom and his entourage are the first to slowly make their way to the tent, singing prayers for the blessing of the union. Next comes the bride. Hidden from sight under her wedding robes, it may look like she's entering the union as the subjugated partner, but that's far from the truth. Despite the almost legendary warrior reputation of Tuareg men, Tuareg society is matrilineal. Women own the family tents. Only women are allowed to learn and write the Tuareg language, and all hereditary rights are passed to the firstborn daughter. And as the party goes on into the night, our thoughts drift to the next leg of the journey. Naji has located a desert guide and some vehicles. Our next stop is Garama, Libya's desert Atlantis. This is Mansour, and he's been learning his craft since he could walk. You know, to me, out here, it, it looks all the same. I mean, how, how, do, how do you and the other drivers navigate? How do, you, how do you know which way to go? I started with a Tuareg guide, you know, going with me all the time, and then I learned my own way. I mean, I, have, I can do it so easy now. This is an unforgiving place. Few can survive here, let alone live here. Well, you need to have another car to, to travel with. So you always have to travel with more than one car? Definitely, yeah. Has, has anything ever happened to you? Have you been stuck out here? Yeah, I've been stuck out once. I had to wait for two days almost until another car passed around. hundred miles deeper into the desert, at the oasis of Sabah, is one of the largest camel markets in North Africa. At any one time, there are upwards of 25,000 camels here, most of them from Sudan. Traditionally, this market supplied the beasts of burden for the great camel caravans that crisscrossed the Sahara. Today, though, most of these animals will be sold for meat. Three We've stopped here three to replenish months. supplies. And not surprisingly, Najat quickly becomes something of a curiosity. Muhammad Ali's been buying and selling camels here since he was a boy. He's made the three-month trip from Khartoum more than 40 times. And yet he's never seen an uncovered woman from Tripoli here before. <laughs> That means he's uh, like he's showing to you that he's a little bit angry. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 Well, like uh, like a man when they argument between each others. Yeah. Yes, fighting. Yeah. Another herd's just come in. Muhammad Ali knows to the last pound of flesh what they're worth. 
On the other hand, the seller knows what he wants. It's time to hang. What are they saying? There is some argument between each other. And this one, he said that he is the part of the uh, king of the camels, and this one is the part of the rubbish of the camel, yeah? <laughs> so one says it's very good, and the other says yes, it's very bad. Yes, that one says it's very bad. <laughs> and this is the part of their job, you know? They, yeah. they, they are very, very exciting inside of them. Well, I think it's a part of Africa, you know, the bargain and the deal and loving to argue and yeah. haggle, you yeah. know? Because yeah. Yeah, they're all absolutely enjoying yeah. themselves. And they are very happy now. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually, the deal's done, and I suspect Muhammad Ali's got the price he wanted. It's a timeless scene, and one that could easily have been witnessed by any charioteers that came this way in Roman times. <laughs> Tonight's camp is at the charioteer's equivalent of the truck stop, the oasis of Gabron, one of a handful of life-giving lakes that stretch across the desert. These oases were most likely what made it possible for chariots to cross this harsh and hostile world. Tomorrow, I discover what little remains of an all but forgotten civilization as I enter Libya's desert Atlantis. Waking up in the idyllic oasis of Gabron, you'd be forgiven for thinking you were in some earthly paradise. Rather, than deep in the Libyan Sahara. My journey in the tracks of the chariots has taken me from Gadames to Gabron. Next stop, Gurma, the site of a long forgotten city. My translator, Najat, is experiencing camping in the desert for the first time. Good morning. Morning. Some tea for you. Thank you. Every morning you look like you just walked out of, of, a, of a beauty salon and I'm all beard and you know. Isn't it? Yeah. You, what time do you, you must get up at five o'clock to start? No. No? No. Really? Please. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> it takes only 15 minutes, not more. So how did you sleep? I did not sleep well yesterday. Yeah. Every 10 minutes waking up for the wind. Yeah. yeah. I think I got about four hours, yeah. maybe that, yeah. in one stretch. In these modern day four wheel drive chariots, with wide, slightly deflated tyres and powerful engines, great distances can be covered quickly in relative comfort. But could traditional chariots with wooden wheels have really negotiated these dunes? And where would the drivers have found the food to feed their horses? What's likely is that for much of the time they didn't have to travel across the dunes because they could travel down these. They're called wadis. This is the wadi al Hayat which actually means the valley of life. Wadis are hard-packed valleys, which could possibly have supported the chariots and their crude wheels. More important, perhaps, is the fact that this valley once ran through the center of an empire that spread across 70,000 square miles of desert. Now, for 3,000 years, people have been living in these, and not just nomads, but actual cities. This was a real civilization right in the middle of the Sahara. 
This is the land of the Garamantes, and today the secrets of their world are being revealed by a combined team of archaeologists from Britain and Libya who are excavating the Garamantians' capital, Garama, a desert Atlantis that's lain buried by the shifting sands of the Sahara for centuries. Team leader is Professor David Mattingly from Leicester University in England. And we're now stepping into a Garamantian house. This is a domestic space uh, with very particular Garamantian features. Here we've got a, a Garamantian hearth. Um, this is Ancient texts describe the Garamantians as a backward, activity. barbaric and nomadic people. Like this. And Professor Mattingly and his colleagues are now proving those texts to be wrong. That, that, that's really a, a common stereotype that we have of, of Saharan peoples, and we share this with the Greek and Roman writers, that we imagine people as being uh, essentially nomadic. But, um, you know, we're, we're here in the heart of an oasis, and uh, an oasis is all about sedentary living, agriculture. At their peak, the Garamantians made the desert bloom. They built a 3,000-mile network of irrigation canals linked to underground aquifers. Not really the sort of thing barbaric and nomadic people usually get up to. This is the, the bit of Gara, ancient Garama uh, that really catches the imagination, I think. We've been looking at those domestic structures, and they clearly t give the lie to the, the view that these people are, are nomadic. But this is a temple it built in a Mediterranean style, and it, and it clearly influenced by the architecture of Rome. There are columns standing along here. We've got fragments of the capitals and the bases and so on. But it's one of a sequence of big public buildings that exists in this part of the ancient site that really made this uh, a metropolis. So was this the real end of the Roman world? Was this as far as the chariots really got? So with the metallurgy and the different uh, artisans they had, they, they would have had the technology to make chariots and, uh, and weapons of war. And to maintain them and to yeah. use them, yes. Before we parted, Professor Mattingly tantalizingly told me that there's evidence of chariots having got even further into the desert. He'd never seen it, only heard of it. But it's out there somewhere, in the mountains that separate Libya from Algeria. Tomorrow, I come face to face with the charioteers of the Sahara. The Sahara in southern Libya is actually a collection of deserts. Everything from immense seas of sand and stony wastes to rugged mountains. We're following in the tracks of the chariots, heading towards the most spectacular mountain range in the entire Sahara, the Akakus. <laughs> We're still a day's drive from the mountains and we've run into trouble. Well, this is part of the realities of travelling in the Sahara, that you, you do break down. We've been spluttering along for the last half hour. But uh, what you find when you're travelling with these guys is that anything can be fixed. And usually in about 20 minutes, half an hour. If it was me, it'd be three or four days trying to get something uh, replaced. But they carry everything and uh, can strip an engine apart. Totally. We chose this place to pull up and make repairs for a reason, rock art. For it's on the mountain walls of the Akakas that I hope to find a picture, a picture that may prove chariots cross the Sahara. 5,000 years ago, this wadi would have been a very different place. How do we know? Because the humans who came here to fish and hunt recorded what they saw. 
Well, I guess you'd have to say this is about the last thing that you'd expect to find in the desert, a crocodile. So it poses a really interesting question. How did it get here? What it suggests, I guess, is that the Sahara hasn't always been so desolate. What's trackless desert today was once a lush string of lagoons watering a rich savanna, full of zebra, buffalo, ostrich, rhino and giraffe. And no chariot. To try and find that, we must press on. Back on the road, and we finally enter what can only be described as the Monument Valley of Libya. It hasn't rained in the Akakas for 30 years. Well, this is the reality of the Sahara today. Deep boreholes. 20 years ago, there were oases all over here and a lot more people lived here. But the Sahara is drying up. The water table has been steadily dropping for centuries. Now, there's only one well in this entire region. Not surprisingly, very few people remain. Ali Akbar and his family have stayed on, though. Each day they make the 15-kilometer trip to this well. He's watched as his neighbors and friends have all literally left for greener pastures. So why does he stay? It's because he's the self-appointed guardian of the treasure trove of rock art scattered through the caves in the mountains above his home. Maybe this is where I can find my chariot. Mansour, could you ask him, I know that he is a guardian of the caves and the drawings. Um, one, would he allow us to, to, to look for it? And does he know of any, any drawings like that? <laughs> he says there are a lot actually of painting and engraving on the top of the mountains, but he doesn't want to show them because uh, they might ruin them, you know. So does he show them to anybody? No, he doesn't actually. He doesn't show it to anybody. Except if somebody's official coming from the government, he would do that. Yeah. Otherwise, he wouldn't. Well, I mean, that's good because th that will preserve them. Oh, yeah, definitely, you know? yeah, yeah. As far as a chariot goes, uh, there's one you know about. Mm -hmm. um, is he happy for us to go and look for that, do you think? Yeah, he says twos are around here and everybody can see it, he doesn't have any problem. But the others, no. Ah. I wouldn't show them. Mansour may have heard about paintings of chariots. The problem is, he doesn't know exactly where they are, and there's no guarantee of finding them. The Akarkas is a maze of high-walled, interconnecting valleys and blind canyons. Many have perished here simply because once inside, they couldn't find their way out. And our fuel is running low. We can't afford to spend a lot of time searching. So Mansour decides to take us to a cave system he knows about. He's never seen a chariot there, but he's only ever explored a tiny part of it. Once, this cave in the valley it sits above would have supported a small community. So how old are these, do you think? Well, according to the archaeologists, they say about six to 8,000 years old. 
and it might be the oldest here in this region. Really? Yeah. And this, this uh, they would have lived in this cave? I mean, this yeah, was a, you know, a site? Yeah, because the, the, the protection and the fuel from here, you know, against the wind protection, you know. Uh -huh. And what about these, these holes here? Perhaps it's for grinding wheat. Oh, really? Yeah. Like a mortar and pestle? Yeah. Oh, okay. In the Akakas, figures constantly seem to loom up out of the landscape. Echoes of the people who once called this place home. This is our last day in the desert. Apart from only having enough fuel for the return trip, we're also running low on other supplies. So we start to prepare for the long haul back to Tripoli. What do you think, Najee? What, does, do you like this country? Yeah. yeah. It's different, isn't it? Different, yeah. It's very different. This is quite a big difference. It's the first experience for him, you know. Yeah. I find it's totally different from where he used to live. And he's in the same country as well. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it's vast. There's, there's so much country.